How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? Excellent. Um, I was very lucky and got to see you guys working on set uh, when you guys were making this, and I knew on set this could be a special movie. Which and, set was that? In Budapest. With, ah, with, yes, at the studio. Yeah, when the storm hit. When, oh, yes. When that gets separated. Right. And uh, But on set, just the costumes, the look of the film, everything about it, I was like, oh, wait a minute, this, this is going to be, this could be really good. Uh, when you were on set, when you were making it, did you feel like we're making something special? No, mostly I was concerned about breathing in too much dust and wearing a respirator and goggles <laughs> to protect myself. But, um, you know, every film really makes is, is special in many different ways. Uh, this one, I think, in every way, because of the range of the narrative. It's not his, just um, the usual dark, visceral world that he often occupies. It has a lot more scope for design as well, in that it's um, near future. It's got three different movies simultaneously taking place. One on Earth at NASA and JPL, another on Mars with Mark Watney and the survival Robinson Crusoe on Mars story, and the third on the spaceship with uh, the Hermes crew. Uh, so there's a lot of range for design um, in each of those. What is the biggest misconception that people have about what you do? I think they think that I do it all myself. And I really work with a large team. Um, in this case, probably there were a, about 30 people in my office doing various jobs from my supervising art director to, you know, the, the office runner. And um, two graphic designers, uh, the uh, concept artists, 3D and 2D, um, perhaps about 10 set designers and model makers. Um, it's a busy drawing office, a lot like um, you would find in any architectural practice. Only, you know, we don't have to build uh, for permanence, which is a big plus. Sure. A lot, a, lot, uh, a lot easier to not have to worry that it's going to stand for 100 years. Right. And, you know, when I say I'm a production designer, they don't know what I'm talking about most of the time. They say, oh, really? What, what do you actually do? And I said, well, I'm like a set designer in chief. And then they kind of get it. Sure. So, um, and then really that's what I am. I, you know, I've started out um, as a draftsman, a draftsperson these days and, you know, climbed the ladder over a course of, you know, um, probably 15 years before I got to actually design anything. And that was, um, you know, very useful to have done all those stages of the work that we do from, you know, drawing. Uh, my first detail, I believe, was a, a a Victorian doorknob detail on a urinal. Um, so, you know, I've come a long way since then. Uh, how soon are you on a movie and when do you leave? Uh, I'm usually one of the first people on the movie once it's uh, been given any kind of uh, go ahead to any degree uh, and involved with conceptual designs, initial. Uh, artwork showing what the broad strokes of the movie visually would be and then stay as long as depending on the scale of the movie um, a year and a half to ten months would be about the range. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, what the collaboration process with the director for this particular project with Ridley uh, what is the collaboration process like? Well I mean having uh, been given the script, uh, then there's, you know, a sit-down discussion about, you know, um, what, how he wants to approach it. In this case, it was about how far in the future are we, about how far to push the uh, design kind of aesthetic and philosophy um, because of the fact that the technology, the botany, the organic chemistry 
uh, and the telemetry of space travel were all crucial to the storytelling, there were constraints um, beyond those that you normally would have uh, in the sense that you couldn't stray too far from the scripted events that derive from specific technologies that help him uh, survive his ordeal. So there was a, a conversation about the range of the time frame and where we could go, how far in the future we were, should there be or could there be any kind of uh, presumption that there were new materials that developed that don't exist now um, because we were 15 to 20 years out and we made those assumptions and at the same time um, being faithful to the current technologies or at least those in development now by NASA or JPL that could be incorporated because they were so completely um, integrated into the storytelling. So there had to be boundaries described in advance, um, both to satisfy the script requirements and also you know, to make it interesting and perhaps give it a little more style than um, what you see currently. Uh, that everybody's familiar with. Sure. Uh, we've all watched, you know, the astronauts on the Interna International Space Station uh, on the news very frequently. And we've seen a lot of films uh, lately that are um, il illustrating, you know, where we're at with space travel. Um, we didn't want to go too far into the realms of fantasy uh, because we wouldn't um, have done justice to the, the novel upon which the movie is based and was very thoroughly researched by the author. And I think also we talked about keeping the spirit of the novel intact with the script, which I think it does um, very well because it was so um, enjoyable to, to read it and you got, uh, you know, an uplift um, about how he survives and it was fascinating to me you know to um, understand to a large degree you know what he was doing and and how that worked um, specifically because I you know grew up in the 1950s uh, at the height of the space race and every little nerdy kid I knew was in a rocket club and involved with building rockets and going out you know, to a big field or a park on Saturdays with, you know, other rocket clubs and trying to launch, you know, to some extent, um, you know, something that you con concocted without killing yourself. And <laughs> um, so I've always, you know, had that, it, it just, you know, space travel, rockets, always appealed to me. I loved, I'm a big fan of 50s and 60s space movies, you know, going back to, some of the early classics like Forbidden Planet, This Island Earth, um, you know, and of course, you know, a little later on, 2001, The Space Odyssey, um, uh, Silent Running, you know, these were the things we were looking at, as well as, you know, more contemporary films, more to, you know, um, avoid similarities, because there have been a, you know, quite a few in, in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, and what, you know, how to avoid, you know, kind of certain cliches. Sure. So there was, a, you know, a balance between finding inspiration in the past and also, you know, a process of education. And, you know, we, I talked about these with Ridley. He, you know, always comes back to Kubrick, because you can't really fault it, because even now it's contemporary. The design philosophy, modular design, elemental pieces of uh, spacecraft, you know, prefabricated, put into orbit and assembled as they do now, as they were doing uh, back in, what is it, 1963? Uh, for, are you talking about the original NASA stuff? Are you talking about the Kubrick stuff? Kubrick. 
I want to. Shit, I don't know what year was 2001. I think it was pretty early. Was it in? Was it early 60s? Yeah, I believe it was. I can't remember. I, I, really know. I don't think I was at university yet. I think I was in high school. So, whenever it was, it still holds up, and we we kind of you know wanted to um, participate in some of his um, ideas, like the gravity wheel which is the only way you can really effectively make gravity in space in a vacuum. So we, we definitely committed ourselves to having a gravity wheel, although we had no idea how to do it. Um, and we looked and looked because we knew that Kubrick had built, you know, a um, complete wheel with, and, and famously so, and there were photographs of it. And um, at the same time, um, we felt that you know, with the tools we have available, that we didn't have to um, do a whole wheel, but we didn't know exactly how not to do a whole wheel. And it took quite a while and a lot of meetings and some physical models, miniatures, um, to kind of brainstorm our way with all departments and Ridley, uh, you know, sitting at a table with a model, of, um, you know, Try to come up with a method, and uh, we eventually, you know, stumbled on um, the Kubrick sequence um, when Kierzele comes down the shaft um, into the drum, uh, and the drum is revolving, and he walks around the column in the center uh, as it's going around. And I was watching it with Darius Wolski, our uh, cinematographer, over and over and over again. And we were trying to figure out what they had actually done. And we realized that when the actor comes around the back of the column, there was a slight shutter jump in the footage. And then it dawned on us. And I said, do you think they reset the wheel and they reset the camera because there was also a dolly move. And we kind of decided that's what they did, that they didn't actually ever go completely around in that sequence in one shot, that they locked off the camera and they stopped the wheel and they positioned the actor to emerge with the new position of the camera and then continued the frame. And that's when we kind of got the idea that we just needed to go 180 degrees to do the shot that we needed because we could put in the rest digitally, which is exactly what we did in the end. It's so funny because, uh, I mean, Kubrick was such a genius back then and it's amazing that, you know, I mean, he's so ahead of his time. Yes, but they also used traditional camera techniques, because they were very familiar with, you know, um, the limitations of the technology. And it's always good to, I like, the other thing I like to do um, is work within constraints rather than in a, you know, limitless genre of, say, space fantasy where anything's possible and technologies, you know, that you don't have to understand, you just presume they work because some magical you know, machine has been devised or some uh, element has certain properties that we don't know about. And, you know, like a dilithium crystal, for example. Um, you know, I'd rather be constrained by the laws of the physical universe, by the, you know, current technology or the near future projected technology as NASA has it in mind. Um, those constraints are more fruitful, I think, for a film like this because they actually give you limits and parameters within which you have to function, as he does um, on the planet Mars to survive. So in that sense, you have to understand the physics and the, you know, the, the limitations of um, space and weight um, because the, um, the whole thing is economics. How much weight can you afford to launch on a given NASA budget, both real 
or in the movie. No, 100%. And there is reference to, you know, program continuing in the movie, funding, um, you know, they view the whole uh, Watney episode as a disaster for their program, but put a spin on it <laughs> in terms of the rescue package being a, you know, a positive so that they can fund the next mission as a rescue mission of his corpse, which, you know, I, you know, I find that, you know, it's very real and, and you know, uh, an issue of uh, the kind of decisions that have to be made in reality. 100%. I want to jump into a few other things. Uh, what's the hardest part of your job and the most rewarding? The hardest part of my job is keeping everybody uh, focused um, on the rules of the game, where you, you set up a, a series of design constraints within certain parameters of a subject, and you give not only what the rules of what you're doing are, but also what they aren't, what you mustn't do, to break the constraints of the design. And if you do, then you lose the consistency of it, if you follow me, whether it's to do with palette or shape language or the way light is used, um, the, the tonalities, uh, the integration with other departments. And I always try to set up those rules and parameters initially. The hardest part of the job is constraining people's um, natural uh, urges to imagination and flights of individuality, um, which, as interesting as some of them are, they break the rules and you lose the consistency of the design and you step out of the world you're trying to create. And that can be destructive. Although I, I do run a, you know, an open forum kind of department where I'm very interested in people's ideas. And if they fit within the parameters, then I'm quite happy to embrace them. But not if they don't. When did you decide that you wanted to be a production designer? Um, I think when I realized um, when I was working as a, you know, a a real architect, uh, which was part of my architect training. I, I was um, hired to work within a, an actual architect's office for a year, uh, which was part of the English qualification program, that I was really, it was too slow and constrained by things I wasn't interested in very much, like building codes and planning permissions and that I had started out doing, you know, theater design, and which was much more free. I was doing stage lighting, I was doing photography, and that um, I had encountered some friends who were doing film as either directors or editors or cameramen. And um, in the course of, you know, knowing these people socially, I began to realize that this might be a world I could uh, inhabit more happily. And so I checked it out and, you know, that's when I decided to leave mother architecture uh, as a profession behind and to try and do things that really interested me, like surface. Sure. <laughs> as opposed to, you know, longevity. And to cheat and, and to, um, I was more interested in artifice and illusion than I was in permanence. So how did you break into the industry? What was the, what was the, the break, if you will, that got you in? Well, I, I was studying at the Royal College of Art and um, in the architectural department, but uh, I found out that there was a, uh, an option for a degree by project where you could write your own curriculum. So I wrote a curriculum for a degree by film production design. And um, there was a certain amount of resistance to that idea, although I was within my rights to um, you know, choose that option. So I wrote my own curriculum 
and I did three projects based on film design. Um, one was based on a, a book, one was based on uh, how to create an artificial environment on an enclosed stage, a jungle set, and the other was how to use a, uh, an existing urban location uh, in a film. And um, I managed to, you know, get away with that. And somehow, coincidentally, I don't know how it happened, but these projects were all based on films that were in development for actual production. So that when I graduated, I had a portfolio of work that was actually of interest to several different designers actually preparing uh, films based on these issues and luckily enough got hired by one of them. That is very, very crazy, weird, and awesome. Yes, well it was very, by that time I, you know, I knew where I wanted to go. And so I used education, you know, in a very specific and pointed way. But I would point out that uh, the Royal College of Art having a film school, an art school, an industrial design school, an automotive section for vehicle design, textile design, fashion design, sculpture, and um, photography, all under one roof. Well, actually, there's several roofs, but they're very close together. Um, is the ideal format of a production design school. And uh, I believe they have a production design course there permanently now. Well, I, I have to, I'm, I'm out of time. I have to ask you one more thing. Okay. Uh, I'm incredibly excited uh, for Ridley's next endeavor. I love his sci fi movies, love. Uh, and, you know, you guys are getting ready to make an al another alien movie. Not me. You're not going to do it? Um, no, I'm, I'm not involved with that one. I'm working on a 15th century medieval fantasy at the moment. What are you working on? Uh, I, 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 walk, I walked in ill-prepared. Oh, I figured well, you were all, guys were all doing it again. Uh, well, they, they are, but I'd like you know, to do new and different genres. And as it's a sequel, you know, sure. there's a certain amount of continuity to the set design. So um, although there are you know, aspects that are new, but um, I'm working on a medieval 15th century fantasy film which is in development. I was gonna say, I'm like, uh, I'm not familiar with this one, or am I? No, it hasn't been an announced yet. Yeah, I was gonna say, that's very, I'm like, I should know this. Yeah, it may be announced in the new year. Um, okay, uh, so you, that's all you can tease. Well, I, you know, I've signed an NDA not to talk about it. Then you should not say anything. I don't uh, wanna get you in trouble. I can tell you the title. Okay. I believe that's been in the press, but nothing about the film. If that's okay, I can tell you that I'm working on a, a development <laughs> project called The Night, okay. which is a 15th century uh, medieval fantasy um, to be announced in the new year. I like the way you're talking. That's my genre. I love fantasy, that, that kind of stuff. And it's something I've not done before. I've done medieval, but much earlier, several hundred years earlier, and I've not done a medieval fantasy, or a fantasy of any kind, for that matter. Listen, I, uh, I'm very excited. I think that this Game of Thrones thing has hopefully helped more fantasy things get made. You know? Well, hopefully it won't be anything like as good as Game of Thrones is and has been. Uh, it won't be uh, as fantasy uh, conceptually. It will be more reality-based so that you actually be credibly believe that the fantastic things that occur are actually real. I, I totally get it. I don't want you to say any more and get in trouble because then I'd feel really bad. Yeah, you won't but, be able to use it. You'll well, be sued and I'd be sued. And, yeah, I won't get sued. It won't, it won't land on my shoulders. <laughs> hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.